Hello, I am Mal, and welcome to Wasteland 2 Director's Cut, How to Handle Combat. Now, this is the uh, third or fourth guide that I've made for Wasteland 2 Director's Cut, and if you are looking for uh, how to build your team, or what you should do in the first couple hours of gameplay, or just what are the changes between Wasteland 2 and the Director's Cut version, those guides are all available, um, and I'll put links at the end of this video, as well as in the description below this video, to make it easier for you to find those things. So, okay, so what are we going to cover in this one? Well, we're going to cover the following things. First, we're going to cover combat positioning and how to, you know, pull a fight, how to initiate a fight. Second, we're going to do an overview of the UI because there's lots of things, and not just the UI, but sort of just, you know, the, the, the landscape in, in combat. There's a lot of different icons um, that if you know what they are, can really make combat a lot easier for you. They can help you identify targets and so on. So we'll go over that. The third thing we're going to do um, is go over the importance of cover and how, more importantly, how to deny it to your enemy via either positioning or cover destruction. That's the key, really, to winning fights. Fourth, we're going to talk about what I like to call CPK, or cost per kill. You know, it, it's kind of a funny thought, but Wasteland 2, at its core, not unlike a lot of RPG games, is sort of a study in the economics of how efficiently you can uh, dispatch with your enemies. So we're going to talk about different ways to take on enemies the most efficient way and the most cost-effective way. And then... At the end, we're actually going to do an example fight. One of the first places you're going to go in the game um, is the radio tower. It's part of the uh, first thing that you're going to do in the story part of Wasteland 2. And so the fight's predictable, and I can show you that fight and how to get through it. Um, and then it'll give you at least an idea, some exposure about how Wasteland 2 combat works. Okay, so if you're joining us from the Xbox One or the PS4, who can now enjoy the Wasteland 2 experience. I just wanted to say I believe that most of this information will be applicable to you as well, and welcome to the Wasteland 2 experience. Okay, so let me make a quick cut in the video, and we're gonna come back, we're gonna talk about the team that I'm using a little bit, and how I got to this point, um, and then we're going to start delving into these various topics. Okay, so I'll see you in just a sec. All right, now let's let's very, very briefly just sort of take a look at my starting team. Now, in my uh, how to build a team guide, I, I go over this in great detail, but here's a picture of my uh, my monkeys, as I like to call them, and their initial um, stats when I started this um, this run of Wasteland 2 Director's Cut. Now, uh, before I got to the radio tower, uh, I have since played um, approximately uh, two and a half hours, three hours. Um, and in my what to do in the first couple of hours of gameplay video, I talk about that in detail. So uh, the reason it's important to note that is this guide is built on Supreme Jerk difficulty. So my characters are somewhat min-maxed, uh, meaning I've, I've tried to make things as optimal as possible. But, they're, you know, th not... They could be more so. Um, you can turn all of your characters into sort of like combat monsters, and I didn't do that. Um, so I think I struck a, a pretty good balance and gave the team some flavor. Now, having said that, as we go into this fight, um, and I start explaining the combat, I do have different equipment and skills that you might not have if you haven't done what I have done. In other words, if you haven't spent two or maybe three hours um, sort of exploring and getting better gear and leveling up your characters a little bit, this fight might be different for you, um, but the concepts behind it and how to handle the fight will be consistent. So it doesn't really matter if you've just arrived at the radio tower and your characters are like level one or two. If you're playing on the default difficulty level, uh, let's see, which would be rookie, um, or seasoned, I think is the default, then it won't really matter if you've spent some time leveling up um, before coming to the radio tower or not, but it does make things a lot easier, obviously, if you get some better weapons. Now, since I'm playing on Supreme Jerk difficulty, um, it's it's a necessity um, for me to make sure that my guys are, are ready to go. Let's go ahead and move into where our first fight's gonna take place. When you get to the radio tower, you come in and you hang a right, and then right over here, you can actually see on the map, it says Raider Cutter. So right over here is gonna be that first conflict. Okay, so let's get a little closer. Hit the space bar if you're on the PC, which highlights all of your soldiers, or excuse me, your rangers. You can hit R to reload to make sure all of your weapons are reloaded, or you can hit this little icon. 
Okay, so let's take a look at the landscape here. These guys haven't noticed us, so we can kind of take a look here. Let me grab my sniper. Now, when we talk about the pre-fight or the, uh, you know, combat positioning, which is the first thing that we're going to cover, grab your longest ranged uh, weapon user, which is typically going to be your sniper. If you hold down, you kind of just hover over this crosshair. You see that red line out in the distance? That's letting you know how far out you can take a shot. So I know I can shoot one of these guys from way back where I'm at. Now, the reason that that's important is because typically you're going to use the sniper or you're pulling. In other words, you're going to initiate the fight with them. A couple of reasons for that. Obviously, the range is a big factor. But the other reason is that a lot of times a sniper, even with a, a relatively entry level sniper, um, as an example, the the R270, which is a sniper rifle you can get relatively early on, or if you're fortunate enough to get this M24 from the Traveling Merchant, um, it's pretty much going to be one shot, one kill on any of these early fights, including the radio tower. Okay, so how do we want to set up the positioning? Well, we're going to deselect the whole group, and we're going to start setting up. Now, they're far enough back that it shouldn't be a real big issue. Don't think they're gonna initiate. If I remember right, in this fight, they don't initiate combat. Like, they let you set up. I think they threaten you to leave, if I remember correctly. So we're gonna move up to some cover. Okay, so we're right up against some cover. I'm gonna go ahead and crouch. Now, you don't always wanna do that. If it's a situation where you wanna start the fight with a sniper and you're, they're just out of range, you may not wanna crouch. You may wanna take a shot, and then if they have a high enough combat initiative and they're the first ones in combat to go, you would pull them back towards the group and you would set what I would, would would call an overwatch trap using this option right here. This little icon with a looks like an arrow pointing at someone. This is to set an ambush, but we're going to go over that in just a sec. Okay, so let's go ahead and move up. All right, move Christy over. Let's grab Angela. Now I'm not going to put everyone in cover right off the bat. I'm just sort of going to just gonna sort of hang out for a second. Okay, last positioning. This looks this looks good. Yep, yeah, okay. Now we can crouch here. Probably gonna end up moving with my shotgun, my leader guy, so I'm not gonna crouch him because getting up or down with crouch, here's your crouch option. Crouch does increase your chance to evade. It also gives you a ch uh, an increased chance to hit. 20% uh, is added to your defense. 10% is added to your chance to hit offensively. Uh, however, it does cost action points to both stand up or to crouch. So if you're going into f into a fight, you don't necessarily want to crouch everyone unless you're for sure that those are where the positions you're going to want to keep. Now, I'm sort of planning ahead. I want to start the fight, and then depending on where the enemies go then I might take Angela and move her up, say behind this boulder, and take a shot. I may send her off to the right, I may move her over here, it just depends. Likewise, with these other people, with my AP monkey, which is my mid-range combatant, I'm leaving her right here, because I know I want to cover this area, and I know the approximate range, see the range? I know that she'll be able to cover this entire flank. Meanwhile, with the shotgun, now bear in mind, you may have to be a little further back than this, because if you have hostiles, they may just initiate the fight, and you won't get a chance to set up like this. So you may want to be like back right around here, if it's a fight that you know they're immediately going to be hostile. Yeah, right about this line here, from where these guys are, would be probably safe to mess around with where you're going to stand. Okay, I'm going to send my energy weapon person- okay, see, go back the way you came, as she got closer. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and initiate combat. I'll take my sniper. And... There we go, and that guy's dead. And the fight begins. Now, let's talk about the UI, because there's lots of stuff to cover here. Okay, so we, we talked about uh, positioning. Now, one of the key things, too, um, with positioning is you want to be far enough back to sort of deny them. Um, the further you are away, the harder you're going to be to hit. Um, if you're behind cover, you're going to be harder to hit. You also want to see if you can force them to move, because if you're if they're out of range, like for instance, this guy right here, and we'll start talking about icons. If you can look underneath this guy's feet right here, you can see there's kind of like a looks like a handgun emblem. 
so you know that he has a pistol. Likewise, so does his buddy back here. Well, okay, I know that their range is not very good. They're gonna have to move to get to us. It's not a question. They will have to move to have any real chance of hitting us. So knowing that, knowing that, I'm gonna take advantage. And I'm probably gonna set up a couple of uh, different ambushes because as you can see right now, I only got a 32% chance to hit. That's not that great. So I'm gonna go ahead and set an ambush here. And now if someone pops out to take a shot or moves forward, the sniper is going to, since he's set to ambush, he's going to take a shot. And hopefully a better shot than a 32% chance against this gunslinger that's buying cover. You can tell that he's buying cover because of the white icon. The shield icon indicates that he is behind cover. Some cover can be, and most cover can be destroyed, be it either with explosives or if you have um, something like a shotgun. As you get into the late game, especially, destroying cover and denying cover to your enemies is a big, big part of combat tactics. Okay, so let's take a look at the rest of the icons. Right here, this blue flag indicates that these team members are under the influence of leadership. So they're be right now they're being granted a plus 6% chance to hit. So what is that based on? Well, the 6% is based on the leadership skill, and the range of it, see this bubble, is based on, you can, you can kind of see it, at least I hope you can. Here, I'll step, I'll move it away and I'll put it back on there. There's like that white circle on the ground that's showing you the range. Okay, so that um, is dictated by your charisma level. So the effect is by the skill and the range is based on your charisma stat. Okay, hope that makes sense. All right, let's talk a little, about, a little bit about cost per kill. So every item, right, has a cost. Each individual uh, piece of ammo costs a different amount um, the, typically speaking, the, the, uh, ammo for pistols or some machine guns are going to be a little bit cheaper. And then you have the more expensive, uh, rounds, which are going to be for, uh, like sniper rifles, as an example, are going to be pretty pricey. Um, now, <clears throat> something to, something to bear in mind, and it might seem kind of counterintuitive, is that even though it has a higher cost, like for instance, 30-06 ammo, even though it's more expensive than some of the other weapons, even with a lower end sniper rifle when you're first starting off, your sniper is probably your most reliable one-shot, one-kill person. So, <clears throat> you, you can't just think of it as, oh, I'm going to fire a couple of 5.56 rounds um, from some type of an assault rifle, and that's cheaper ammo, so it's a cheaper deal. That's, that's not necessarily the case. Um, it may not be cheaper. It may be cheaper to take one shot with a sniper. Um, or, if you've got a target that's wounded, don't take an expensive sniper shot at it, or even an assault rifle. Let somebody that has, um, you know, a shotgun finish off a couple of people for you. Or better yet, just use a melee attack. So if you've picked up Angela from the Ranger Citadel, which I imagine you have... Here, let's swap weapons here. Okay, so I have her armed with a nightstick. Um, if you have uh, not done any upgrades yet, you probably have Ace's Wrench, which is very, very powerful at the beginning of the game, actually. It only costs 4 AP to use. She can typically move to, to a target and still get an attack. It does decent damage. Um, obviously, this nightstick that she's currently equipped with does a ton of damage. But my point being is that your most effective, well, actually not most effective, your cheapest cost per kill is always going to be melee. So if you're in a situation where y you think that you can successfully get some melee attacks in and the risk is not too much to send someone forward, then that's what you're going to want to do. And that's exactly what we're going to do right now. We're going to move her... Um, we could move her behind the cactus, which <laughs> functions like, it must be filled with cement because it actually functions as cover, which I've always thought is kind of funny. Um, but I think what we'll do is we'll move here. Yeah. Now, this does a couple of things. Because I've moved her forward and given this guy an active target, 
she'll likely be in range, my guess is that this pistol guy will take a shot at her. Now she's behind cover, um, and even on Supreme Jerk difficulty, behind cover, she's got, you know, decent hit points. He's not going to be able to one-shot her, so I'm not too concerned about her safety. The guy in the back will not be in range, and he will likely move. My guess is to here, or maybe as far as to here. That's the guy in the back. So, I've got a sniper on uh, ambush, and I will set someone else on ambush here momentarily. And as a matter of fact, I will go ahead and set Angela on ambush as well. They have improved that mechanic in the Director's Cut version. Um, melee ambush never really worked in the original Wasteland 2, but it seems to kind of work now. <laughs> I, at least I've had it function. Um, I'm not going to set uh, any more ambushes, though. And here's why. Because if I one-shot with the sniper, I, I don't want to waste an additional shot for no reason. So I'm actually not going to do anything with uh, these characters back here. Okay, so now I've got the AP monkey's turn, and you can see, here's the, here's the combat initiative. Okay, so based on your combat initiative stat, your derived stat, um, that'll dictate how fast or how often you'll go in combat. So, as an example, the AP monkey has a combat initiative of 13, which is relatively good. You generally want to have a minimum of 12 on all your characters. Okay, so we can see that it's Eve's turn, the combat monkey. Then it's going to be Christy's turn. Then it's going to be Mal's turn, the guy with the shotgun. Then it's going to be this gunslinger. Then it's going to be this gunslinger. And then it's going to be Bear, the sniper's turn again. And then it's going to be Angela's turn. So watching this combat log is pretty important, particularly in terms of prioritizing targets. As an example, if this guy was almost dead, and he's the next guy that could possibly shoot me. He's probably the guy I'd want to prioritize. If the guy in the back was in a position to hurt me, um, and he was actually up next, then I might reprioritize the him and so forth, as logic would dictate, right? Okay, so let's see. What else are we going to do this combat turn? Well, I think that's it. We're going to end turn. Yep, and then... I think I will go ahead and move up with my shotgun person. And just in case somebody crosses over this side, I don't think I can get... Let me see, can I... I'm not close enough to go for a cover destruction shot. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just going to intern it. Actually, I'll set an ambush with him, too. Ambush shot. Dead. Okay, and then this guy moved up predictably to try to close the distance. Sniper one shot one guy right there. Okay, now, let's talk a little bit about the other things that you need to know. See this blue area? Anytime you see this blue highlight, this is how far you can move and still take an action with that weapon. Okay, so if I go here, it's going to cost me two action points, and how far you can move is dictated by your combat speed. Like, for instance, Bear here has got a 2.6, which is extremely high. So he can actually get up, move forward, and still, with a 7 AP cost weapon, still take a shot, which is kind of crazy. But he can. So let's see, he's got a 76% chance to hit this guy. Um, now, if he relocates, he'll be flanking. That percent probably will go up a little bit. But I don't know that it's worth relocating. Probably not, he's behind cover. Chances are we're going to kill this guy before he can act. As you can see, we have Bear's shot, Angela's got a move, Eve has a move, Christy has a move, Mal has a move, and then this guy finally gets to go. The chances of this guy? No. <laughs> this guy's going to be dead like Disco, so I don't really have to worry about him hurting anyone. Alright, so let's see. Now let's look at the rest of... Let's look at the rest of the, the icons and explain things. So, in order to do what they call a precision strike, you would right click on the target and then you have the option to do a headshot and you'll see what the chance is to hit in the increased crit chance and whatnot. You can hit in the torso which will reduce their armor. You can hit them in the legs which will reduce their uh, their mobility. It also has a chance to knock them out or knock them down which is good because then they have less AP to work with to fire back at you. Or you can try to shoot their weapon or their arms um, so they won't be able to do really anything against you. Um, you know, at the beginning of the game, this is really just not much of an option. I mean, I've got a 49% chance to hit, basically a coin flip shot with a sniper. 
Um, so what I would say is just avoid this. This is not that useful at the beginning of the game. Uh, towards the mid and end game, this becomes very important. Okay, so you have this icon right here, which is to squat behind something, right? To kneel. This is to set your ambush, which we saw. That's where someone moves and you can take a shot. Or if they just shoot at you and come out of cover to shoot for a second, you'll also take a shot. This is this icon right here is to swap weapons. So in this case, fists. No, he doesn't want his fists. He wants his sniper rifle. This is to change the firing mode. This icon right here. Now on a sniper rifle, that that's not the case. But on, for instance, uh, an, uh, an assault rifle or what have you, there'll be burst modes or fully automatic modes. And then you have the reload option. Okay. We've got six of eight here, so we've got plenty of ammo. Not a problem. Here's the damage range of the weapon. This is its armor penetration. Okay, so generally the higher that is, the better. Um, if you if you strike a target that has um, high armor and you don't have any armor penetration or you don't have an energy weapon, it doesn't really matter how much damage you got up here because you're just not going to do that much. So armor penetration is a big deal. And then this is the base crit chance percentage added to your other stats for the purposes of that weapon's fire. Okay, and then up here you have your total number of action points. Everything costs actions, right? Everything costs action points. So on um, this sniper rifle, just to fire it once costs seven action points. So you can't do much else with your sniper other than take a shot. Speaking of which... And that's a dead guy. So... What did we spend? I don't know, three rounds? I think we fired three rounds. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Anyway, I'm going to highlight everyone. I'm going to hit R to reload. And then we're going to go up. And we're going to loot. Now, this green circle on the ground will indicate how far you can loot. You can just say, I'll take everything. Oh, there we've got a nice med pack. That's nice. Take that. Got some junk to sell. And those are the sort of the basics of combat. Now, there's more that there's probably a million more things I could go into, but I'm not going to. I just wanted to show you the baseline things that you should do uh, in combat. Now, one other thing I did want to mention, however, is explosives, be it grenades or TNT or even rockets. While there are perks in the game that can increase your, for instance, your throw range, um, they don't require any skills and they don't really miss. It's a free aim weapon. So like if you get something like a mangler, like a rocket, um, hold on to those for your really tough fights. Don't use those early on. Matter of fact, through the first section of the game, which takes place in Arizona, you, you really want to hold on to those to, you know, basically right before you're going to leave the area. And you'll, you'll get the, uh, you'll kind of get indicators of when you're getting closer to leaving the area, but hold on to your explosives. Um, at least rockets, things like grenades and whatnot. If you're in a pinch, yep, absolutely use them. It's reliable, good AOE damage. Um, and it's a good idea to make sure that everyone has a secondary explosive available. Now, in my case, my uh, sniper monkey actually is my demolitions expert. Not that the skill matters, um, but I'm going to take certain perks that are going to add, for example, to his throw range. So he's generally his swap instead of being a pistol or something like that. His, his backup is probably going to be a grenade. So there's, you know, just think about how you can integrate explosives into your group. There's lots of different ways to do it. Okay, so in this guide, we covered combat positioning. We did an overview of the UI. We talked about the importance of cover. And again, positioning your people to pull them towards you so that they run out of cover, thus denying your enemy cover. We talked about cost per kill, being that melee is the most cost effective. So if you've got somebody that's got a blunt weapon or just brawling or what have you, that, that having some of that, particularly early in the game, is going to save you resources, so you may very well want to have somebody that is melee focused. And then we did this example fight here at the radio tower. So I hope this was helpful for you. If it, if it was, you know, please let me know. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those questions as well. Thanks so much for watching, and until next time, I am Mal, and I'll see you later.